Eh, vi begynner den første seansen med et foredrag av, som, eh, som skal ta for seg digitale strategier. Det kommer til å foregå på engelsk. I, etter en liten dialog med paneldeltakerne så har vi også funnet ut at debatten etterpå kommer til å foregå på norsk, rett og slett for å gi rom for mest mulig trygghet og nyanser hos de som er deltakere der. Det er avklart med... Macallister, så det som blir det bare, uh, og det tror jeg blir bra. But first of all, I'm very happy to, to introduce uh, Mac Macallister. You are uh, Director of Digital Strategies in The Guardian. Uh, and you are here to talk about uh, digital strategies in local media, example and new projects. Could you please enter the scene? Just a few questions uh, before we are starting. You are representing a company that maybe has done the most important uh, journalistic revelations uh, since Watergate with your uh, NSA uh, stories. How is it to work in that kind of organization with that much focus right now? Yeah, it's, um, it's really, really exciting, I have to say. Um, it's very intense, obviously, but uh, when um, you get into the news business, um, it's, it's this kind of environment that you're actually wanting to be a part of. You're wanting to be a part of a place that's trying to have uh, a big impact on the world and to um, you know, challenge, uh, hold power to account. And it feels like we're really, really in a sweet spot right now doing exactly what The Guardian does best and what journalism does best. And when you get your culture and your output all working that way and then uh, seeing the impacts of that and seeing the conversation change in the wider market and amongst people who you know, weren't aware of these issues, it just feels like everything is working really, really well and doing what, what it's supposed to do. Do you watch your back while you're having these days? I do, yeah. Um, I think everyone's a little bit more careful about what emails they send. Um, you know, I just, just uh, the other day, uh, uh, Alan Rusbridger, the editor, the Guardian editor, uh, his PA sent me an email asking if I had time to answer a question uh, on his behalf. And so I have to go to a meeting to meet face to face with someone who's representing him. Uh, you know, it's quite confusing all this, but at the moment, um, we have to be very careful about what we send and say and to whom. You were also uh, going from a medium-sized British newspaper to be a global actor on digital news. Uh, how did you do it and why? Well. Um, I think that you know the big big reason is really the internet. Um, it it's created a lot of opportunities and challenges, as as everyone here knows. Um, and the fact that we're an English language um, newspaper suddenly meant that our competitive set uh, became absolutely massive. And I don't think, as um, an English-speaking newspaper, you can you, you don't have the option uh, but to either go really really big or to get very, very local. There's no, there's no comfortable middle ground uh, to operate from. So I don't think it was, it was ever a choice. Um, it was something we just had to do. But you have obviously done something right since you are in that position, being one of the largest even American news uh, organization right now. How did you do it? I, I, think, I think a lot of it has to do with the, open, the openness, the open strategy, the idea that um, that what we're doing is for the public good and therefore we need to give it to the public. And embracing that not just in a, in a business context and saying here's all our content for free, but actually fully embracing it and really encouraging people to be a part of, of um, what we're doing. Um, I think that's had a big impact. And also um, being really steadfastly committed to um, our mission and doing real journalism. I think you know, it's one thing to just be open and free and another thing to actually really invest in uh, the investigative reporters and giving them space and resources to do what it is they have to do. Hmm. You are here to talk about local media uh, and, and, uh, and the digitalization. So we are very hungry to have you here and we are looking forward to hear your speech. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so I, sh I should clarify a little bit about my role so you know what perspective I'm coming from. Um, my, my job at The Guardian is to sit a bit outside of the core of the business in our day-to-day -day operations and to think about where the market's going, uh, what kind of trends, uh, new technologies, uh, new commercial models 
um, are out there that we should be taking advantage of. And I'm charged with actually creating some new businesses that are digital from conception um, that, that, that actually sit outside of, of the business itself in hopes that, that we can build some businesses that create new revenue streams uh, for The Guardian um, that take advantage of The Guardian's brand and its mission and, and some of its resources, but that ultimately we can spin out and turn into independent businesses. I'll talk about one of them very briefly, um, uh, but part of the reason um, I'm interested in this topic is because uh, I think there's a huge, huge opportunity in local media, and that's, that's one of the things I'm working on. It's, I think the, the whole local media story is a, is a very mixed bag. I think it's a, right now, um, we are at the beginning of a phase where there is huge, huge opportunity. However, the, the overall story in the market is actually a really, really difficult one. And so we're in this kind of uh, make or break period, in my, in my opinion. Um, and so I, what I wanted to do in this presentation was to, you know, let's get some honest truths uh, out of the way first and then talk about some of the ways I think the, the, uh, where the opportunity is and where things are growing. Um, but let's, let's be honest about a few things. So I think everybody uh, who is in uh, publishing, who has a print business, wishes that there was a chart that looked something like this. Um, this would be kind of, I think, best case scenario for a lot of people. And in some cases, the print business, you know, this isn't based on real numbers. I'm just kind of making a point with, with, with some of these slides. But in some cases, the, the print business is falling much faster than that. In some cases, it's much more flat than that. But I think everyone kind of felt um, a couple of years ago, or maybe a little bit longer, that the web business was, was big enough and exciting enough that at some point, it would lift the rest of the business. It would cross the declines in print and get people back to a, a position of, of growth and strength again. And I think the truth um, is something much more like this, that, that the, the whole digital transition um, that everyone is, is going through in some capacity uh, is actually making us uh, much smaller. We have to operate with smaller teams, with, with tighter budgets, with lower revenue streams. Um, it's a very difficult position to be in. And it forces you to think really hard about who you are and what you're trying to do. There is some hope in mobile, definitely. This is a, you know, obviously uh, everyone is experiencing um, a lot of growth and there are a lot of exciting things happening in the mobile space. This is, again, not real numbers, just to give you an idea of some of the things that, that, um, that we're seeing uh, with mobile, where we've got lots of different kinds of revenue streams um, that we're starting to build around mobile businesses. So there's display advertising, subscriptions, sponsored products, new products that are, that are sponsored, um, and, and paid content. The growth rates for all the mobile stuff is fantastic. Um, the audience numbers vary uh, quite a bit, and in fact are, are quite small. And um, this, this brings up a lot, a lot of problems. The fact that these audiences are so small means a lot of these business models don't really work. Not, not in a sustainable way, at least not at this point. So the, you know, one of the things that, that seems really obvious um, that when you have paid content in a mobile environment, um, that, that suppresses adoption. It's really hard to get people to, to buy content uh, in, in any environment, uh, mobile um, included. The freemium model, seems like a really easy answer to that problem, uh, but the conversion rate from free to paid, whether that's subscription or not, um, is, is not strong enough to make the audience numbers interesting or to make the, the paid revenues um, really pay off. So that, that's kind of a difficult problem as well. And then, you know, as, as I said, getting, getting the numbers um, at a scale that's big enough uh, is really difficult. You know, Apple does not help uh, in, in getting you exposure for uh, your apps. Um, and then, you know, if that wasn't enough, if that wasn't a hard enough problem, the CPMs are low on the advertising. So advertisers are still very early into this game, still trying to figure out how they're going to reach, uh, you know, get their messages out. They're not paying a lot. And the ad formats that people are coming up with uh, don't perform fantastically well. So all these factors combined make the mobile business, while very, very exciting because everyone's attention is moving there, um, it actually makes it a hard business to, to turn into something real. And in fact, we're, we're starting to look at 
this kind of a problem where we've got this big giant, or you know, maybe, maybe that's not big and giant, but compared to our mobile businesses, we've got a web business that is completely overpowering what we're doing in mobile and making it diff difficult for us to balance these forces. And when you look at a chart like that, you start to worry that maybe the same thing that we're seeing with the print and web <laughs> transition, maybe that's gonna happen again with mobile, and maybe mobile will actually uh, make things difficult for us. These are market conditions, right? These aren't things that we necessarily have a whole lot of control over. And so while that seems you know, quite difficult to deal with and maybe even a little bit depressing, there are some things I think we can do to, to change the way we think about the problems. So strategy people like to uh, figure out positioning. How is it that we, where do we sit in the market? And I think this is a common view of the world where people look at uh, influence versus profit. And those, those two things are often uh, at, at opposite ends of a scale. And so is stability and growth. And what I think a lot of local media uh, and regional media in particular have, have wanted to do is to take that whole space, sit right in the middle, and because it used to be so much easier to control the channel and how you relate to uh, your end users and your advertisers, you could be strong in all these areas. But that's, that's changed. The internet has kind of ruined that model and that way of thinking. And a lot of, a lot of local newspapers and, and regional newspapers have moved up into that space where they want to be profitable and stable. They want to exist for a long time. And by doing that, they've had to give up in these other areas and become less influential, do, do journalism that isn't as strong, um, and, and to let some, uh, some of the, the digital pure plays uh, experiment in this space instead. But the interesting thing is there haven't been a lot of digital pure plays who think in this way who have succeeded uh, dramatically like some of the, the, the dot-com platforms out there. The, these are all really good examples of fantastic work. Baristanet uh, is one of the hyper-local services in the States that's done very, very well. It's, it's very important, um, and it feels like it's going to be around for a long time. Uh, Every Block was a brilliant um, approach to uh, thinking about local media at, more as a utility, and, and Patch, uh, as, as you know, a lot of people read about, has been very good at uh, really growing fast, and in fact, you know, even though they're cutting things back, they may turn out to be profitable in the end. But none of them are able to establish that position in the middle. And I think the problem isn't, uh, isn't so much the market, I think it's this way of thinking. I think this approach to solving the problem of local media in these kinds of boxes is the wrong way of looking at the problem itself. And it, it comes back to this old idea that media is, is a production consumption relationship with users, that you produce a piece of content, you deliver it to a person, and in that transaction is where the value is. That's, that's the old way, that's the manufacturing way, that's how you build uh, hard, you know, real world products. The internet has changed all that. And people like Evan Williams, who uh, you know, is the, the guy who built Blogger and Twitter and now a new service called Medium, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, all these guys think in a very, very different way. They think more about networks. The, the, the internet itself is the medium uh, that they're, they're working on. Uh, it's much less about the destination. And they, their, their view of the world is something more like this. Uh, you know, it varies from, from service to service. But they all commonly think of end users, of partners, and innovation. These are all ingredients into the service that they offer. And they think of the service that they offer as an enabler. It's much more about giving people the power to do something, creating a platform where they can work, um, creating principles around what that platform is offering to the world. And then the outputs from all those things are products and stories and data and all sorts of things that you can make money from. It's very different from the old model of creating something, delivering it, and getting value. It's making all these things ingredients into a system. There's also a, a, a macro context here. And this, is, this slide is a couple years old now, so it's not, I, think, I think it's actually evolved a bit. But I think the way the internet and the, the way the network has evolved is based on something that looks a bit like this. So in the beginning, 
uh, when the internet started taking off, when the web started taking off and people were able to make websites really, really easily and get them out there, um, there was an explosion. Everyone wanted to have a website. But at some point, there were too many. And it became complicated and it became hard to find what it was that you were looking for, which is when the first kind of big platform breakthrough happened, which was Yahoo. Yahoo worked out how to categorize everything and make everything very easy to find. Once everything was findable again, people got excited and started publishing uh, using new technologies, database-driven websites, template-driven websites, tons and tons of pages on each of these websites, which at some point Yahoo couldn't deal with. And along came all the search engines, Google obviously the winner, but Google was not, you know, remember Google wasn't the best or the first at search. The thing that they did was a business model that, that went along with the, the offering. And, and it goes back to that way of thinking of their service as a platform. That was, that, that was one of the key things that made it possible for them to become Google. Same thing happened again, though. Everything got easy because you could use Google to find everything. But stuff inside of those articles became hard to find. And, and, and what was interesting became hard to find. The, the, the sheer volume of stuff in Google was just too much. And people started to use each other as filters to find things. And that's part of why Twitter and Facebook came, became so important. They had human filters to find information. I think we're in this kind of somewhere along this curve uh, up past that, but maybe further than where these, dotted, these dots go. Um, I don't, you know, who knows what the next big breakthrough is going to be, but I think there are some signals that, that actually point to everyone who's sitting in this room. I think local media is a big part of it. The acquisition spree that's happening um, should be a big indicator of that. So all the, all the acquisitions happening uh, amongst these big dot-coms, not all of them, but many of the acquisitions are local and mobile-based acquisitions. They know that this space that you guys are all in right now is the most interesting space to be in. And they're trying to find startups that will help them get an edge because they've got a big business they have to protect and it's very hard to actually transition into these other phases without having some very strong resources um, that are exclusively focused on this problem like you guys are. Google is, is a great example. This is actually from a couple of years ago now. They are very much in the content business. They, they bought uh, Zagat and uh, Fromer's Travel Guides, Waze. Uh, these, are, these are content plays. Google is very much um, a, a competitor in that, in that sense. So what's, let's, let's go back a step. What's some of the evidence that um, right now is such a great time to be in to um, local media? So uh, Nielsen um, did a, consumer, um, a mobile consumer report uh, that was quite interesting, and it showed amongst the top activities uh, that people are doing on mobile devices are news, local search, and weather. Well, everyone here does news, local search, and weather already in, in different ways. Also, shopping and, and retail is something that, that people in this room, I think, are, are you know, quite savvy with. These are the big activities that people are doing right now. That should say a lot about what you can, what you can do, that the market wants what it is that you offer. There's also um, a really uh, interesting piece of research that I recommend uh, downloading from an organ a UK organization called Nesta, um, where they looked into hyperlocal media um, and uh, spoke to a lot of people who do care very much about um, local coverage, local media, and found that um, the people who do care uh, about local media care even more now than they did two years ago. And you'd almost think, because of Twitter and Facebook and all these platforms that their attention would have gone there instead of to local media. But in fact, they care more now than they have before. So then they, they started asking, what do you, you know, what kinds of services do you want from local media? And no surprise, people want functional information from brands that they recognize, publishing brands that they recognize, from local businesses, from local government services, things that they know. It's, it's, it's really encouraging to see that the core market, the core purpose for local media existing um, is being expressed by, by people who uh, want local media services right now. So let's go back a little bit further and, and talk about some ways that people are kind of reinventing this, you know, the concept of what um, local media can be about, and it sounds like you discussed a few things this morning. 
Um, we've got, so one of the projects I'm working on is this service called Notice um, that, that helps uh, publishers offer end users um, a way to post uh, videos and pictures and, and text directly to them. Um, we've been working outside of The Guardian and using The Guardian as kind of our first major client. And we've done a couple of projects. The, one of the big uh, successful projects we did with The Guardian using, using this platform uh, was a campaign called GDN Gig. Uh, and all we did was we, we just um, worked with the Guardian music team and asked them, uh, the, the, the Guardian music team asked users to take a picture of a live gig. So when you're at a music event, get a picture and just add the hashtag GDN gig. So whether you're doing that on Twitter or Instagram or our own platform notice, use that hashtag and add location to it. And that was kind of a critical piece to it. We had thousands of contributions. So loads of people were doing this. And they even got a little bit competitive about it. Certain regions wanted to make sure that their area was being addressed. Um, and, and in some of the tweets, even called out and said, hey, let's make sure that we're faster than you know, this other area. Um, it was quite encouraging to see uh, how willing people were to do this. We've done a lot of hashtag campaigns and a lot of things with Twitter and Instagram, some of them more successful than others. There's something about this one that really took off. So, you know, I think it's easy to sit where you are and look and say, okay, well, The Guardian's got this huge digital presence. It's very easy for it to get a bunch of people to go participate. We, we have done campaigns that have had, you know, literally a handful of people participating. There was something about this one which asked people to do something they already do. So they're already using Twitter and Facebook to take pictures of live gigs. They're already doing that and posting that for their friends. When you post it for a publisher, it's a very different kind of relationship with, with your media and your intent. And I think people actually posted higher quality pictures because of that. I think you know, by seeing your photo appearing on the Guardian website in this uh, crowd map that we did as a result of it, uh, it, it, it encouraged people to do more of it, and I, and I think the, the picture quality got better. Interestingly, that then started to snowball because once there was a space where people were starting to um, have this conversation about live music around the UK, the bands got involved. So there were some bands that were taking pictures of themselves backstage playing ping pong and stuff like that. It was a, it was a fantastic uh, campaign. And one of the great outcomes wasn't just the pictures, but we also discovered a few new writers who, who could do some work for us. The next thing um, off the back of that was uh, The Guardian going all in on this idea of citizen journalism. So uh, my team, uh, using the Notice platform, built Guardian Witness, which is uh, very much like CNN iReport or um, Al Jazeera has a very powerful citizen journalism platform as well. Um, but we're um, doing it more from a mobile perspective first and encouraging pictures over uh, text, um, and that, that has turned out to, that, that was just somewhat accidental. It was more part of the user experience that we encourage pictures over text uh, than any intent, and there was something that has really resonated with people. We're getting thousands and thousands of uh, contributions to, to Guardian Witness now, some of which are very lightweight. Um, you know, we're asking for pictures of your pets sometimes, and, and a lot of that's just to kind of build the community. Um, but then when real stories come along, we've got this built-in community that we can go out to and ask for them to report on the news. And one of the great um, examples of that uh, was in Brazil when there were the riots, um, the protests a couple of months ago. Um, we asked uh, for people to tell us what's going on out there. We didn't even have a news article yet. Took us about 24, it took us about 36 hours to get the news article out. And we got hundreds of pictures and videos like this uh, within the first several hours of the protest kicking off because we had used this, this, this platform to encourage people to send us stuff directly. The... Um, the, yeah, there, there are several fascinating lessons about that. I won't go into it too much because I think I'm running short on time. What's the, oh, I've got it now. Um, 
There are some smaller examples of things that can be done too. Some of these things are, you know, take a lot of resources and, and can be difficult to build. Um, Nesta has been funding some interesting projects like this one here um, that is just taking local government data and helping people to be um, part of the conversation about um, uh, local planning applications and real estate development. Uh, there are nice ways to jumpstart your mobile strategy with um, service providers who can give you a, a mobile app for, that you can just plug your content into and stick your brand on. Um, this, I think, is one of the most interesting things I've seen in a long time, though. In the state of New Jersey, in, the, in America, um, all the uh, local and regional uh, media sources, uh, news organizations, including um, many local bloggers, hyper-local bloggers, including Bristonet, uh, have joined up into this story exchange. And what they do is make their content available for all the other members of, of this exchange to be able to repost. And they've used a, a, a service um, called repost.us um, that I, I highly recommend um, having a look at. They basically make it possible for you to take an article and to make it embeddable just like a YouTube video. It's just copy and paste the embed code, stick it on your website, and up it goes. I think this is really, really clever. It's a great way of building, you know, it builds reach for the smaller guys, it, it gets niche content for the bigger guys, everyone wins. And commercially, uh, I don't think they've implemented this yet, but commercially they have, um, uh, they're building an ad network. So the source of the content that gets reposted um, gets an ad that travels along with that article as it goes around the internet, just like a YouTube video. Here's an example from uh, NJ.com, which is the big regional uh, publisher in the area, um, reposting an article from Baristanet. So Baristanet gets a nice placement for their logo and their brand. They get a link back uh, to their story, wherever this story, to the original story, wherever this story appears on the internet. The huge advantage in that is it builds your SEO. So Google will reward sites that have lots of links coming back to it. This is one way to, to make that possible. Um, the byline is there, and as I said, the, the, um, the ad network uh, will, will grow on top of it. And then they also make it possible for other people to repost it. I think this is one of the smartest things I've seen in, in local media in a long time. I'll quickly go into some of the things that the future is kind of saying to us, I think, if you draw a line from where we've been to where we are, you can start to make some assumptions about where things are going. Um, I, I, a lot of people are talking about um, you know, the Internet of Things and, and every device being connected to everything all the time. And I think that that's definitely, um, that is going to happen. I don't know in, you know, the, the whole kind of technology revolution happens in big waves. I don't know when this wave is actually really going to matter to local media. It's very hard to say. But it's something that you can start to listen for, um, which, which I think is a smart thing to do. The, again, following the lead of where the big dot-com players are, uh, where they're going, um, you can see that this is, this is certainly something they're investing in. So Google Glass is, is the, um, you know, kind of the front runner of, of this idea. And I think just like, you know, Google really struggled with social. They've, they've, they still haven't really gotten it right. They've tried several times, and they can't seem to get it right. I think they're going to struggle with this as well. And this, this piece on um, the US TV show uh, uh, Saturday Night Live is a satirical look at Google Glass. But I think it says a lot about um, how things could really go wrong, and I think to often do go wrong for the big dot-com players when they kind of get their strategy wrong. There's a little bit of a rude bit in there, I apologize, but it's funny. Okay, now to give it a command, all I have to do 
you say, okay, glass, okay? Now, what's your Wi-Fi password? Oh, let me see, it's Pika. Okay. <gasps> Pika. Pika. Password, Pika. I mean, you, you do have to give Google props for, for trying. You know, it's very difficult to, to be as big as they are and to change as dramatically as they do prove that they're able to, to do. That's a very difficult thing to do. Um, so uh, what they're doing with cars, what they're doing with Google Glass, um, I think we should be thinking more in terms of those as signals to the future rather than actual things that, that are going to have a big impact on us. So let's, let's just draw that line quickly from the, the past to, to the future just to give you some ideas on, on things that you can do now to start preparing for where things will go. The, the change in the market, as I see it, looks a bit like this. From mass media world to one that, uh, to the, the PC internet revolution to one where there's the ubiquitous network. And it used to be that um, you know, your media would come to you. Now, uh, you know, in the future, it's going to be that, that media will find you. Um, that you. That media will respond to you and what you're doing and where you are, rather than you having to control it with a mouse or a keyboard. Um, it'll be very interesting to see what happens with the mouse over time. My, my kids uh, are constantly trying to swipe my laptop screen. And, and have no idea what, what a mouse is. They've never seen one in our house. Um, there's, there's a, there was a point, you know, now we're, we live in this world where everybody is a, is a producer of, a content producer of some, some sort. And it won't be long before everything is a producer. Everything is going to shed data. And that's going to add to the, the complexity of the network, as we were talking about before. And then lastly, we'll never be unconnected. Being unconnected will be uh, a premium in many ways. So th those are some of the signals, and, and, and from that, you can start to deduce, based on where we are today, some things that can help you prepare for that inevitability. Um, the first, the first thing I would say um, is, is don't, don't assume that the big guys are going to um, trample all over you. Um, the, some of them are in a very good position. I would definitely watch out for Google as a local media publisher, first and foremost. I think Facebook and Twitter are going to try very hard, and I think they're going to struggle. Um, but don't assume they're going to win. This, this is an open field right now. Right now is the time to be in, in local media, in, in my view. Um, some of the ways you can get a stronger position are by, by federating, working together with, with other publishers, smaller and larger, um, activating communities, you know, getting, getting them to a position where they're actually participating in something, trying to achieve something, is much better than just asking for their comment. One of the, the lessons we've learned from Guardian Witness is that the people who are sending us photos are much more creative and interested and positive than those who leave comments, who are, who are typically there to, 
um, correct us and to criticize us. It's a, it's a, the, when, you, when you look at the desk of the people who are moderating the, the stuff coming in from Guardian Witness, they have smiles on their faces and they're sharing pictures and they're laughing. You go by the people who are moderating the comments, they're frustrated and depressed and, you know, it's very... <laughs> Um, this, this is critical. Don't focus too hard on your website. That's a destination. Focus more on the network. Who are you partnering with? How are you getting content back and forth from each other? It, that's much, much more important than how good your website is. And part of the way you make that possible is by building um, systems where it's very, very easy to share and reuse your content. If you do all that, I'm hopeful that when you look back at that, you know, that chart that we wanted to have that I showed as the, the second slide with the web business overtaking print someday, that maybe the reality is something that looks a little bit more like this, where print, let's assume it declines, because I think it will for most. Um, print declines, digital gr grows, your digital owned and operated products and services, the things you control, that they grow. Hopefully that, that line is more steep but I, I'm not sure it will be. And then lastly, that this combination of these things plus your network, the people you work with, the way your content, your business model extends across the entire network, that the, the combination of those things puts you in a much stronger position than you're in today. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think we open for a few questions from the audience, if there are any. This is quite clear. The future is bright. Mm -hmm. uh, if not, I'll uh, thank you very much for giving this uh, very interesting perspective on, on examples in local media. We will keep on with the panel discussions, and, and we will call up Yonio in the English language if, okay. if there is any... Uh, expertise before we need in that way. Thank you very much okay, for staying you. this uh, time with us.